The New Testament lesson this morning comes from Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Several years ago, I was in a grocery store, and I have to admit that I was looking pretty grungy. I had been working in my yard and working in the dirt and the soil, and um, at the end of the uh, hot time of working, I I wanted some lunch. I didn't have uh, anything for lunch, so I decided to go to the store and get uh, a loaf of bread and some other things, and... I did wash my hands, but that was all. (laughs) And I walk into this store, and um, as I say, I I know I was looking pretty grungy, and uh, you know how you go in and out of the aisles, and you run into people you know, and I go up one aisle, and there's a church member, uh, someone I see every Sunday, and I just felt so nasty. But I I walked up, and I greeted her, and I began chatting with her, and I, I could tell she looked a little uncomfortable. And I got the sense she was kind of afraid of me. And then it dawned on me, she didn't have a clue who I was. And I said, it's me, Maynard, the pastor. You see me every Sunday. And she said, oh, I didn't recognize you without your robe. I had the feeling she was going to say, I've never, I didn't recognize you. You look so nasty. But she said, in your robe. I think that's happened to a lot of us. We run into people, and for an instant, we just don't recognize them. They're out of context, or it's been a while, or something. Now, this text from the gospel is a a strange text, 
And it's about that kind of experience. Jesus is in the midst of these folks who are walking on the road, and they're talking about all the events of Jesus' death and the report, the report, the initial report of his resurrection. And they chat together, and Jesus comes alongside it, and they don't recognize him. And this is interesting on several levels. On one level, it is a dramatic presentation of what the world is like today. There are so many people walking on their journey in life. And even though Jesus is in their midst, they don't recognize him. They don't have a clue that he's there. And there are times in our lives when we're going along in our journey and we feel that Jesus is not there. That God is absent in our lives. We struggle with cancer and the days are dark. There's pain and despair. The bills are high. There's uncertainty. It seems that Jesus has deserted us. We go into work one day only to find out that we've been fired. And we feel overwhelmed. We're wondering how we're going to make ends meet. Our self-confidence is gone. And we're so discouraged. And we feel that Jesus is not there. Our spouse dies, we feel alone, we're confused. It seems that Jesus is nowhere near. Part of the wonder of this New Testament reading is that these people are walking along the way and they are in deep, deep grief. They had hoped that Jesus would be the Messiah and now he's dead. And even though they are hearing these early reports about a possible resurrection, they don't know what to do with that. Their grief is overwhelming. It seems that Jesus is nowhere near. He's distant, he's absent, he's gone. And yet in this story, Jesus is there all along. They just don't sense it. You know, we often think about Mother Teresa as a great saint, greatest saint of our age. And she never had any doubts at all. She had such faith. She walked with God and had such devotion. And yet for nearly half a century in her life, the last half of her life. She felt absolutely nothing of the presence of God. And letters that were revealed after her death, letters that she wrote to some of her spiritual leaders and mentors, she confessed that she did not feel the presence of God in her life. It started coincidentally, or perhaps not coincidentally, when she began tending the poor and the sick of Calcutta. And it continued for the rest of her life, except for a brief period, in 1959. Imagine, she remained faithful to God and obedient to God, even though she did not feel, personally feel, the presence of God in her life. Now that's a tremendous faith. It's a faith that's not dependent on her feelings. It's a faith dependent on her trusting the promises of God. And what she felt was not unusual. Some of you have felt that. In the Old Testament book of Job, Job is a man who lost so much. He lost his property, his financial resources, his family, his children. In chapter 23 of the book of Job, it says, If I go forward, God is not there. If I go backward, I cannot perceive him. If I go to the left, he hides. If I go to the right, I cannot see him. The absence of God is what Job felt. It's it's something that was felt by the psalmist in our Old Testament lesson. In the 22nd Psalm, the writer says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From my words of groaning, oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. It's the very psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross as he hung there in pain and agony, close to death. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every week, we stand up and recite the Apostles' Creed. And in that confession of faith, <clears throat> <clears throat> in 
In that confession of faith, there's a great line, maybe one of the most important lines of the creed about what we believe about Christ. He descended into hell. Now, in Ephesians Ephesians chapter 4, the writer talks about how Christ both descended into the lower realms and ascended into heaven. And we like to remember Christ ascending into heaven, but we don't give much thought to him descending to the lower realms. If we give any thought at all about Christ's descent into hell, we might consider what St. Peter said in his first letter in chapter 3, in which there's an ex explanation about why Christ descended into hell, which was to preach to the, the gospel to those who died before his earthly ministry and therefore didn't know the possibility of salvation offered by Christ. Now those passages alone in Ephesians and in First Peter, they alone make that doctrine an important doctrine, this descent into hell. But what makes this line resonate with people meaningful to people is when you consider what hell is. Traditionally, hell is defined as the absence of God. Now, of course, hell is not literally the absence of God because there's no place where it can exist where God does not exist. But it is the perceived absence of God. And in the Apostles' Creed, when it says that we believe that Jesus descended into hell, that is a reminder that Christ descended to a place of absolute absence, perceived absence of God. And when he hung on the cross and cried, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was at that moment in a place where he did not perceive the presence of God. He was at that moment in hell. So remember, when you are in pain in your cancer treatments, when you're in your dark time of grieving the loss of a loved one, when you're struggling with a divorce, when you're being bullied and punched around physically or emotionally, when you walk out of your workplace after being fired, whenever you feel that God is not present in your life, that he has disappeared from your journey, remember, Christ has been there. He has also descended into hell, and he has felt the absence of God. You are not alone, although you may feel that you are, you're not. And in this text from the gospel, these folks are going on a journey, and they are grieving, and they are hurting. Christ has died on Friday, and now it's evening of the third day. And while they have heard that Christ is risen, they don't really know what to make of that. And they feel alone, and they feel isolated from God, and yet Jesus Christ is right there, step by step, with them. They don't feel the divine presence, but the divine presence is not dependent on what we feel. It is dependent on the promises of God. Now, in this scripture passage, we get to a point where all of a sudden they do become aware of the presence of God. The way the scripture puts it is, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Great line in that passage. So how did that happen? How did they move from feeling that God was absent to having their eyes open to the Lord's presence? Three things had to take place in this passage. First, they listened to the word. Luke says, as they walked along the road, Jesus began teaching about Moses and the prophets, interpreting to these other travelers the things about himself in the scripture. Now, if you don't feel God's presence in your life, start reading the Bible. Listen to the word of the Lord. Engage in God's word. Second, in their time of despair, they came together. When you feel that God is absent, do not make the mistake of isolating yourself from others. You need other people in your life. You need the company of family and friends and the church. And that's what they did in Luke's gospel. They felt alone. They felt isolated. They felt the absence of God. But they walked together. They ate together. They stayed together. And that helped them to see the perception of the presence of God. Third, worship. 
Now, in Luke's gospel, they ate together, but it's more than a simple meal. Listen to how Luke describes this. As they came to the village where they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he was going to go on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. It's almost evening. And so he went and stayed with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they saw him. Now, what does that sound like? Took bread, blessed, broke it, gave it to them. That's communion. That's the Lord's Supper. That's worship. So when you feel that God has left us, don't leave God, because God has not left us. God is still with us. Whether we feel God's presence or not, we need to continue to come to God in worship. So these three things help us when we feel the absence of God. Listening to the Word of God, keeping fellowship with other Christians, and continuing to worship. In Hebrews 13.5, there's a great promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. The presence of God is not dependent on whether we feel it. It's dependent on the faithfulness of God. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed all might, power, dominion, and glory, today and forever. Amen.